All right. Um, let's get started here with my uh, interesting case presentation. I'm Damien. I'm one of the second year residents here. And I've uh, kind of set the stage. This is an August night, about 2 o'clock, 10, 15 people in the waiting room was 30. So we're, we're clearing it down, starting to get some people who a little less acuity. Um, and I walk into one of our center rooms and there's a 60 year old male, previously healthy truck driver, comes in with sudden onset of left upper quadrant abdominal pain while at his granddaughter's birthday party earlier today. It's sharp, doesn't radiate anywhere, some nausea but no vomiting, no constipation, diarrhea, no blood in his stool, no urinary symptoms. So this slide is a good representation of his past medical and surgical history. He has none um, whatsoever. Uh, this is, uh, he does smoke half a pack a day, that's about it. This is a photo from Willowbrook, Kansas. No hills or mountains, but we, we have some sunsets there. Um, let's see, so on physical exam, um, he's pretty well appearing, he's sitting in, in bed. He's um, a little obese, but otherwise really no remarkable findings on the exam with the exception of the abdominal exam where he's tender in the left upper quadrant with some voluntary guarding. He's trying to be tough, but you can tell he's hurting a little bit there. Um, his vitals, he's normal tensive, he's not tachycardic, he's um, afebrile and not hypoxic. So it's a differential <laughs> diagnosis. Um, with abdominal pain, we like to, to um, kind of compartmentalize the abdomen, uh, abdomen rather, um, with left and right, lower and upper, and some people throw an umbilical, epigastric. But really, everything kind of hangs out in there together. Um, it's one continuous space. Um, when thinking about this patient for his um, differential diagnosis, I was particularly concerned about, well, is this diverticulitis living up there? Um, is this just uh, dyspepsia? Is this a gastritis? Is this a gastric ulcer? You know, you worry about the spleen. Could this be a splenic infarction or a splenic abscess? Probably less likely. Sometimes you think about stuff in the right upper quadrant kind of pushing its way over there, um, some referred pain. But um, we did do some labs, ordered an intake. Um, we got the abdominal pain panel, which uh, here includes CBC, electrolytes, some liver enzymes, biliary work. The only thing remarkable was an elevated white count of 17,000. Don't know what to make of that, um, especially isolated in and of itself, but it is a little high. He was given 100 mics of fentanyl and was feeling pretty well um, afterwards. He actually requested to go home. Um, we denied that request because this is a guy who hasn't been here before. Um, has been to his doctor for past 20 years and now has pain. So um, this is the CT scan. You can see some things where it's not supposed to be. Um, I couldn't see that, but the radiologist did. He said, look, the cecum's in the left upper quadrant, whereas it's normally supposed to be in the right lower. And also he has appendicitis. Uh, so <laughs> it was a little bit of a shock to me, but I was glad, you know, the presentation didn't seem just quite right. So the CT scan definitely gave us a clue into um, what was going on. So let's talk about appendicitis, most common intra-abdominal condition requiring surgical um, intervention. And about a third of patients who have appendicitis actually have referred pain outside of the right lower quadrant. Very few have pain extensively outside of the right lower quadrant, and this is known as left-sided acute appendicitis. And there's two etiologies of left-sided acute appendicitis. There's intestinal malrotation, um, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And the second one um, is situs inversus totalis. This is when everything turns on itself and is mirrored in the, the opposite direction. So people say never get an x-ray for appendicitis. Well, if you're thinking it might be atypical and you have situs uh, totalis inversus, maybe a chest x-ray would give you some clues. So I did a little review of the um, left-sided uh, appendicitis. There's not a whole lot of literature, as you might expect, but there was a retro... Um, uh, case review of 95 cases where they pretty much uh, search certain words that would um, clue you into that this might be um, left-sided appendicitis. And of those, um, most of them that they found were actually situs inversus totalis. Now the numbers may be skewed a little bit. I personally think situs inversus totalis is probably a little more interesting than mid-gut malrotation. So those are cases are probably published a little bit more. But um, Basically, there's not a whole lot of differences in how you treat this, how you manage it compared to other ones. So let's talk about intestinal rotation. So this is the physiology of intestinal rotation when you're a little baby inside the womb. The gut leaves the, about six weeks, and then when it's doing that, it rotates 90 degrees, and then um, when it's going back in, it rotates another 180, um, all counterclockwise. Um, so that's why everything's kind of all jumbled up in there. So it's a total of 270. 
Um, the, what goes wrong is not necessarily a specific thing. Lots of things can go wrong. It can not rotate. It can rotate the wrong way. It can rotate partially. Um, but basically, one of the big complications of not rotating correctly is that you can get some peritoneum wrapped up with you, um, what's called LADS bands, and they can cause complications down the road as well. So um, this is a little breakdown of intestinal malrotation. About 1 in 500 people are born with it. 8% um, of those born will be symptomatic used to be thought that everyone who was symptomatic from malrotation is before a year old, but actually a lot of people who are older get their symptoms um, when they're in adulthood. So you can see the breakdown there. Um, so let's talk a little bit about sinus and versus. Like I was saying, um, autosomal recessive gene of your whole, whole body pretty much mirrored upon itself. 10% of Cartagers syndrome, um, which is uh, uh, just the primary ciliary dyskinesia, so it's more of a, a, a cellular level, it causes infertility and lung problems. This here is um, Randy Foy, he's uh, one of the more famous people, he's a basketball player. Um, so uh, let's talk about left-sided appendicitis by the numbers. Here's your incidence of having all these things. Basically, um, there's uh, like a 1 in 10,000 chance of, left, uh, of someone getting left-sided appendicitis just based on getting appendicitis and getting one of the inverse, um, sinus inversus or malrotation. So this patient's clinical course, he was given some antibiotics, um, didn't need any more pain medicine, surgery came down, they were like, oh, this is, this is kind of different. Um, they did it, took him to the OR, they did an appy, they didn't find any lad bands, and they just let him go. So um, in closing, you know, when you're thinking about abdominal pain, a lot of stuff goes on in there, keep a wide differential. Um, when you have elderly abdominal pain, as Dr. Wangsgaard would say, you know, take it very seriously. Don't, don't write checks um, your body's patient. Uh, your patient's body can't catch. <laughs> so, um, one of the best movies ever made, I think. So, uh, I think that's it. Uh, the last page just references.